Yo, Ronnie. Yo, Lou. Hey, you know we're baby boomers. Yeah. Born between the years 1946 and 1964. Boom. A, a lot of people blame us for a lot of things. Uh, Good things. <laughs> well, that's what we're here to defend today. Uh, the baby boomers are responsible for some of the most major ways the world has changed and we are going to remind and share with you some of those on this episode of Men Are So Smart. Don't miss it. Hi there, welcome to another episode of Men Are So Smart. I'm Lou Gallagher. Core of Ronnie. We're so glad that you joined us today. We've got a great show for you. Uh, as we said in the open, baby boomers have been blamed for a lot of things that have happened in the world, but the truth of the matter is, we have changed the world in many, many ways and made it better. Today, we share some of those ways with you. Number one. All right. Baby boomers made driving safer. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't say thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, those seatbelts were invented all the way back in 1885. Mm -hmm. Most baby boomers remember youths in which nobody wore them. No. Um... But all that changed when boomers started coming of age. First, in 1968, with a new law requiring that all vehicles come equipped with working seatbelts. Mm -hmm. uh, then in 1984, when the boomers uh, at Boomer Lawnmakers made wearing seatbelts a legal requirement. I remember that. And, they, and as I've said before, what they do is they direct their marketing towards kids. Right. Because they know adults are hard to change, but yeah. if they start with kids, it becomes habit. And then next generation, it's it just happens. Right. Uh, it's estimated that seatbelts saved more than 255,000 lives between 1975 and 2008, according to NHTSA, which is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And for... No. Skip it. Oh. Okay. Uh, next up, we <coughs> pioneered rock and roll. Yeah, we did all that. Damn straight. Rock pioneers like Elves, <laughs> Chuck Berry, weren't technically boomers, okay, but the audiences who remember and embrace them and turned their music into a cultural revolution absolutely were. We took a very simple genre of pop music and elevated it to an art form. Going to see a boomer artist like Bruce Springsteen in concert isn't just about the excitement of the live music. For us, it's akin to a spiritual experience. And for more classics, all you have to do is look around. They're all there. And music changed so much from 1960 to 1980. Here's an interesting thing, though, Ron, in terms of uh, demographics that I've noticed over the years. There have always been, as far as I can remember, an oldie station right in a city or a town yep and what happens is the generation that grew up with the music that is considered to be oldies wants to hear those songs over and over and over again because it takes back to a time and place right however the thing is this demographics change as people get older and die off that music is not as popular and so the definition of what classic rock or rock and roll is changes as each decade, decade goes by. Right. Uh, the people, and I meet them all the time. I work at a station here in Sacramento that plays 70s and 80s music. It's called K-Hits, 101.5. What they did was they made a conscientious decision to stop playing 60s music. And 50s. They played 50s also. Most recently, the 60s, because those people... Are not alive anymore yep. and when people come up to you and they go I wish you guys would play 60s music I want to explain to them the situation but it's better left untold you'll be dead soon so <laughs> we're not really worried about you you don't have discretionary income right etc 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 it's all about the money yep. in the radio business trust me yep all right all right this next one mm-hmm we invented the internet. You damn straight we did. Boom! Just drop that right there. Suck it, the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ronnie. All right, you're emphatic. We, we killed it. Yeah. 
the internet didn't happen overnight. No. It began as the World Wide Web, mm -hmm. a system to organize, link, and browse internet pages. And it came about thanks to a boomer. Uh, no, we're not talking about Al Gore. He had nothing to do with it. No. <laughs> he did not invent the internet. Thank you. Uh, we mean computer scientist Tim Berners-Lee, born in 1955. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, he created the software language that made web pages possible in 1989. Uh, younger generations may sneer when their boomer parents or grandparents try to use social media, but without us, they wouldn't even have Twitter. The Twitters. Done. Mic drop. Uh, indeed. Okay, next up on our list, we created personal computers. Don't talk to us about that. Computers have become so ubiquitous that it's now considered strange if somebody doesn't own one. But you probably didn't realize that every computer you ever owned or will own is thanks to boomers like Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs and the father of the personal computer, Ed Roberts, who introduced the very first computer marketed for home use, the Altair 8800 in 1975, and it was about that big. <laughs> and for more information on the origins, uh, you can check it out on um, uh, Wikipedia. Okay, this next one. Baby boomers, we ushered in the era of screen time. But it didn't mean the same thing. A little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. You think millennials are addicted to their phones? Boomers invented screen addiction. Yeah, take that. During our youth, we were hypnotized by everything that popped up on the small screen, the TV they're talking about. Right. Uh, making us feel more connected with the outside world. According to Newsweek, it's estimated that boomers watched an average 12,000 hours of TV before they turned 16. And you wonder why I never got any homework done. Ooh, and you, uh, I mean, it's it's true. We watched every. I even watched. I watched Lawrence Welk. I watched Big Time Wrestling mm -hmm. uh, with Hank Renner. I watched the Beverly Hillbillies. I watched Gilligan's Island. I love Lucy. I watched sports. I every your life revolved around TV. When you went to school, what did you talk about? Did you see something on TV last night? Yeah, the Flintstones. Right. Oh my God! Everything was TV, and it always ended your weekend by watching the Wonderful World, World of, of Disney. Yes. You no. Know? Yep. That's when your weekend was over, and you knew you were going back to school. And your weekend started on Wide World of Sports. Right. The guy coming down the slow, the ski slope. Agony and... of my feet. Yeah. <laughs> They're killing me. My dogs are killing me. Okay, how about this? How about this, Debbie? We invented and launched Saturday Night Live. Now I know what you're saying. It's not the same thing anymore, and that's fine. Yeah. But what we did was set the bar. Whoever has come since then and gone under the bar, that's not our problem. We launched Saturday Night Live. Yep. People like John Belushi. Bill Murray, Gilda Radner. Chevy Chase. Oh, my. The list goes on and on and on. And, you know, i got to tell you the truth. I know that it's uh, satirical, but Alec Baldwin's impersonation of Donald Trump are hilarious. And you know what you say to yourself? Well, I don't like that he makes fun of my president. They've made fun of every president we've had since launched in 1975. Yeah. It's not something new, people. No. Okay, no. and you know that's what comedy is: right. looking at real life, observing, and making people laugh. How often was the president the butt of every monologue, late night monologue? Right, Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, Jay Leno, mm -hmm. uh, David Letterman. Yep, they all make fun of the current president. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who it is; even if they voted for him, they're going to make fun of him. It's all, yeah, you know what. You gotta have thicker skin. Please, people. Yep. All right. What what did baby boomers do next? What? We turn movies into cultural events. Oh, sure. Like like Star Wars. Star Wars. Yeah. yeah. Before filmmakers mm -hmm. jo uh, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, two boomers, by the way. Right. Uh, movies were just movies. Ticket lines that snaked around the street to get into an opening night screening was unthinkable. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then came the first legitimate event film, Spielberg's 1975 epic, Jaws. Oh, that scared the crap out of Woo! people. Nobody uh, wanted to go in the water. No. 
uh, made an entire nation terrified to go in the water. I just said that. And eventually brought uh, brought in a staggering four hundred and seventy million dollars at the international box office. Yeah. And that's not even close to the record today. No, it isn't. Uh, it wasn't just a fun weekend diversion either. Movies like Jaws, Star Wars became cultural events. I mean, God, that's true. Uh, you think now about opening night, the the Joker Yo. is the newest Batman. Oh, I so want to see that. Same thing. I've heard it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's supposedly it's a little dark, but you know what? I I think Batman. Yeah, Batman is dark. Batman the is theme. dark. Yeah, so that's that, that's the way it is. Boomers hardly invented feminism, but we definitely spearheaded it into popular culture with the women's liberation movement that began in the late 60s. Remember when we were burning bras? Oh, I remember burning mine. And that's what happened to it. (laughs) Female boomers were the first group to have mostly earned their own money for most of their lives, and that's never happened before. Uh, Jane Carroll, author of the book Accidental Feminists, said prior to that, poorer women had to work for a living, but they were pitied for having to do that. For my generation, it became an aspiration. Greatest thing that ever happened was allowing women into the workplace for a plethora of reasons, not the least of which is equality. Right. Um, Women have added so much into the decision-making process, and now we don't see as many as we should, but there are so many women that are CEOs of companies now right. that have made the world a better place. Uh, and, you know, well, first of all, I think homes being as unaffordable as they are kind of forced that down people's throats. You had to have two incomes. You had to have a two, two-income family. Right. But, you know, still the thing that we're probably behind on is that women probably make an average of about 75 cents to every man's dollar. And that's, we need to bridge that gap just a little bit better. Hey, if they're doing the same job, and you, so for the sheriff's department, it yeah. doesn't matter. We're, we're union scale. So Man or woman makes no difference. Man, woman, it's it makes no difference at all. And so, But that's the way it should be everywhere. Uh, you start out, if you're doing the same job, you should make the same pay. Yeah. So. And you know what? Don't think that, and this is an empowering thing. Don't think that, the bar should be lowered for a woman as opposed to a man. And what I mean is um, if you want to be a police officer, you have to, you have to go through all the same training and all the same requirements as a man. And when you do, uh, we, we had this situation recently with the uh, world cup soccer and the women's team. Right. Uh, they were demanding equal pay. Uh, but see, here's the thing. <sighs> Women's soccer is not something that you see on TV that can be sponsored right. at this point because not enough people will watch it. That's supply and demand. So should the women soccer players make as much money as, say, the men do? I mean, to that point, they just held the WNBA finals. Mm-hmm. Anybody out there know who won? No, I didn't even know you had the had finals. Yeah, there's a finals. And right. a, a women's team won. It's not and they don't make near what NBA players make, but they don't they're not generating the same amount of money. Well, it's so, all about demographics. I get it. I totally get that. But I mean in I think sports is kind of an exception to that rule. I think women doing the same job, if you work for the same company, if somebody works in your office and they're doing exactly what you're doing if they've been there the same amount of time because many jobs have like a step increase over the years where you make a little bit more money sure so anybody with the same experience same amount of time in the job regardless of sex should be making the same money i agree all right hey this next one and i i take this one to heart baby boomers we took volunteering to new heights uh, boomers are often criticized for being the me generation, but we aren't nearly as selfish as our reputations would suggest. When President John F. Kennedy established the Peace Corps in 1961, I uh, created opportunities for everyday U.S. citizens to go overseas and help break the bonds of mass misery. 
Thousands of letters poured into Washington from young Americans hoping to volunteer. Uh, it's a commitment to help others that continues to this day. Americans of all ages express their desire to perform some sort of service to their communities and nation. So I've mentioned it several times, but I volunteer at uh, Front Street Animal Shelter. And I'm a dog handler and a dog trainer there. Uh, it's, it's the most rewarding work I do of anything I've done. Uh, and I, again, I prefer dogs over people. <laughs> so well, You know what, Ronnie? I know what's at the, the root of that feeling that you have. I know exactly what it is, and I'm not sure you've identified it, but this is what it is. The reason that you volunteer for pets is because pets have no voice. Right. Yep. They can't speak up for themselves, and somebody needs to, and you're filling that gap. And you know what? I just worked at an event Tuesday where we did free microchippings. There was no, it's kind of channeled towards low income people, but they don't, there's nothing they check. And I mean, microchipping is not expensive. I no. 75 bucks. Right. And you know what? You're, the price of your dog, the, the value of your dog is way more than $75. When it's lost. When it's gone. Until you realize, you know. Yeah, when it's gone, you know, getting it back is a lot easier with a microchip. Though political leaders like Ron Ronald Reagan <laughs> and Mikhail Gorbachev tend to get all the credit for ending the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, in reality, it was the boomer generation who pushed the hardest for thawing relations between these two global superpowers as boomer humorist P.J. O'Rourke simply stated in an article, we brought down the Berlin Wall. Mr. Gorbachev, take down that wall. <laughs> I just got goosebumps. <laughs> I remember that. I remember it vividly. Mm -hmm. I heard it, on, uh, heard it on the radio. I didn't actually it might have been me. <laughs> <laughs> it may have been. Yeah. Because uh, I was not aware that uh, Ronald Reagan was on FM 102. Yeah, he was. Yeah. He was. All right. This one... Again, is something that I'm pretty happy about. Baby boomers, we made waves in forensic analysis. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, boomers lived in a world where serial killers like Ted Bundy, Richard Ramirez, and John Wayne Gacy were a horrifying reality. But then a British boomer named Sir Alec Jeffries, who's a professor of genetics at the University of uh, Leicester, discovered sequences of within strands of DNA that were distinct and unique as fingerprints. Actually, more unique, mm -hmm. possibly. Uh, we could immediately see the potential for forensic investigations, Jeffrey recalled, in a 2012 interview. Needless to say, the discovery had a huge effect on murder investigations. Mm -hmm. And television shows. <laughs> yes. Uh, the Radford Serial Killer Database Project found that 1980s were an all-time high for serial, serial killers in the United States with 235 separate serial killers operating each year on average. <clears throat> so when I was working at the jail, Sacramento County Jail, we had in our custody the first man in the United States to be tried by DNA, DNA evidence only, and he was found guilty. His name was Paul Stephen Mack, <coughs> and he. I worked on this the floor that he was on, and he was pretty confident that he'd never be found guilty strictly by the DNA evidence. He's Poor still choice. In, he's still in prison, <laughs> by the way. Yeah, and just recently, a very close uh, murder investigation here. We had the East Area Rapist, also known as the Golden State Killer, um, found by DNA. They found some familial DNA through the 23andMe site. And then they went after a beverage cup in his garbage? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once you throw something in the garbage can, it's, it's out there. And so they went through. They went through his garbage. They found a cup that he discarded. They swiped a little DNA and off of it. Guess what? That's our man, mm -hmm. responsible for, I think, like 75 rapes and maybe, I don't know, a dozen or more murders. 
and the murders actually he moved out of the Sacramento area and he was down in the the Bay Area yeah. or something mm -hmm. and uh, they're piecing all these together he's going to be on trial he may he may die in custody yeah it, the, it may never go to court because there are already thousands and thousands of pages of evidence yeah it, it might take forever um, you know I mean that, that really was something that changed the world in that there's no denying DNA evidence. No. Much the same as cameras that we have everywhere now. Yep. Uh, it's kind of hard to deny when they have your face right there on the camera in the location. Right. How can you dispute that in court? The <laughs> only way you can dispute that is if, by suggesting they're invading your personal privacy. Yeah. But still. I worked a vehicle accident, happened in a parking lot, where one person was waiting for a parking place and somebody backed out and hit him. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but there was some, um, actually, I think they backed, they backed front to front to back. So the person in the front car said, I was sitting here and this person pulled into me. This person goes, that's ridiculous. I was sitting here and she backed into me. Like, well, this is a real freaking mystery. Mm -hmm. Oh, except there's a webcam right there. Went inside the business, uh, looked at the the video, and came back out and said, I have the video in my possession on this thumb drive. Would you like to change your story? Uh-huh. It probably would be best. Yeah. Yeah, I, I may have hit her when I backed up. Yeah, it could have been. Mm, yeah, you did. Uh, things changed. That's exactly what happened. All right, I'll tell you what. We're going to wrap up with this one this today. Uh, what did the baby boomers give to the world? Well, when we were growing up, Ronnie, parents did not get divorced. Right. That was just a no-no. Um, you were in that marriage to make it work. Yeah. Something changed. For a long time, divorce came with a social stigma that made it seem like an unthinkable option. But the boomers changed all that. According to a center, 70% of boomers believe that marriage should be about mutual happiness and fulfillment. Mutual. Not just raising a child together. In other words, staying in a marriage for the kids is not their plan. No. Asked to choose between divorce and an unhappy marriage, baby boomers are more likely than millennials to say divorce is preferable. Researchers note. I gotta tell you, that of all my neighborhood friends, zero divorced. Uh, I'm, I'm their parents. Right. None of the parents of any of my neighborhood friends were divorced. It was kind of odd. Yeah. Uh, because it really, man, it just didn't happen in the '60s. My parents divorced uh, when I was about 15, and I, I'll tell you, it, was it because of the kids? Um, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Although it would seem that way. <laughs> I see your point. No, uh, it, it doesn't matter. But I was 15, and I got to tell you, I was part of that stigma. I felt horrible because I was now one of those people whose parents were getting a divorce. Right. And whose parent, uh, whose family was being split up. Yeah. And um, something, something, it had an effect on me. I can tell you that right now because, you know, I'm pouring out my soul right now. When that happened, when my parents divorced, a question came in my mind, which was, can one man really stay married to one woman for his whole life? And at 15, the answer for me was no. Yeah. Because that's what my parents did. Now, flash forward many years, I've been married twice. My first marriage lasted about eight years. Um, this my second marriage and last marriage for sure we were just talking about this ronnie this last night again at cocktails my wife and i had our first date on the day of the san francisco giants oakland a's world series oh wow the earthquake the earthquake series that was our first date wow we were going to watch the game with some friends at somebody's house and I was going to pick her up at work. And um, 
And so the date of that was like October 17th. And right. today we're shooting. It's just a couple of days away. Yep. And I'll tell you this. It marks 30 years. Wow. 30 years we've been together, 28 married. Uh, and so in spite of my parents divorcing, they were only married for about 17 or 18 years. Um, I, I proved that wrong. Yep. Well, so. I've been married since uh, 1985. So that's what, 34 years. Mm -hmm. But then we also dated for three years before that. Mm -hmm. So, you know what? I don't think it's so much. And, and you know what? I don't. If somebody gets divorced, that's the way it is. Yeah. I don't look at it. I would say, oh, shame on them. Shame on them if they try to make something work that's unworkable. Right. But did you try to make it work? Well. Or is it disposable relationship? Day? Yeah. Sometimes that's the case. I know my daughter just mentioned to me that one of her friends who I know fairly well. Um, she's been married uh, about a year. It's not going to work. That's, yeah, it's not I don't gonna understand work, that. Yes. That's, it's kind of like, like I say, my first marriage was eight years. You know, at least we tried. Right. We really tried to make it work. And then we realized that we had grown in, in different directions and yeah. it wasn't going to work. In any case, that's going to wrap up today's show. Uh, baby boomers have done a lot to change this world. We and to it. you millennials, we say... In your face. Yeah. Okay. Try, try to, to do that. Try to match that. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for watching. Our website is menaresosmart.com. On Facebook, at Men Are So Smart. Email Lou at menaresosmart.com. Or Ronnie at menaresosmart.com. We will see you on the very next episode of Men Are So Smart.